This is Dennis McMahon and welcome to Positively Vermont. Today we are going to be exploring the wonderful world of Vermont's covered bridges, uh, a local and New England uh, icon, uh, and a very interesting uh, group of people uh, called the Vermont Covered Bridge Society. And my guests today are Joe Nelson, who is a founding member of the Vermont Covered Bridge Society and author of the book, Spanning Time, uh, Vermont's Covered Bridges, and Steve Miyamoto, the uh, publicity coordinator for the society. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks. Well, first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, each one of you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved with Me Vermont's first. Covered Bridges. Oh. Well, how Vermont Covered Bridges got started. Uh, the story begins in Jeffersonville, where the Cambridge Junction Bridge was in deep trouble, being quite an old bridge, as a matter of fact. And a uh, gentleman, Bill McCone, uh, uh, was interested in having that bridge rescued, called on Ed Barner and myself, because we're both authors of Covered Bridge books, okay, to join his historical society as the Covered Bridge Committee, which we uh, let him know that, well, we weren't terribly interested in, 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 in being part of his historical society. We would be interested in having a, a, a statewide Covered Bridge Society. So that's where we got started, organizing from there. Um, we're, uh, we founded it in the May of 2000 uh, as a nonprofit 501c3 organization dedicated to the promotion and preservation of Vermont's remaining covered bridges. Uh, since our founding, we've committed ourselves to uh, generating public awareness through our uh, various means, like we have a quarterly newsletter which we mail out to uh, interested people uh, like VTrans and, and like the governor and uh, members of the uh, legislature. And uh, we also have a VermontCoveredBridge.com website and uh, connections with VTrans Construction Division. And on. I mean, tell us a little about yourself, uh, Steve. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, from New York originally. Uh, moved to Vermont in 1993. Uh, my employer gave me an opportunity to relocate <laughs> at the time. So, um, <clears throat> been here since 1993. Uh, got involved with the Covered Bridge Society um, pretty close to when it started. Funny story is my wife actually saw a little blurb in the newspaper about the <laughs> Vermont Covered Bridge Society forming. Mm -hmm. So she said, why don't you look into it? So I did. <laughs> That's great. So I did that and have been involved on and off, took some time off for a while, but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, That's, that was my involvement there. That's great. Well, tell us a little bit, what is a Covered Bridge? A lot of people might not what know what they might see it on a calendar or on a Christmas <laughs> card. Tell us, what is a covered bridge? Basically, it's a wooden bridge, okay? Um, our forebears, of course, came across, many of them English and so on, uh, were acquainted with the uh, construction of the old buildings over there, and they brought that knowledge with them. And of course, they came into uh, a wilderness. Vermont, for instance, was a wilderness. No roads. You could get around on the rivers and so on. They would uh, come through those woods, creating new pathways and so on, and they'd come to rivers and they'd have to ford them. Okay, ultimately they widened those pathways and they used their fords and they cleared forest and they planted their crops and then they had to take their crops then and find a place to get them ground. Well, one way to do that would be to an old tree stump and, and make a, board, a, 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 a pestle out of it, a mortar and pestle out of it, and grind their corn, or they could carry all of this 
unground corn on their backs through the fords, through these ancient roadways, until finally they had enough people out there that they began using these rivers then to create mills where they could grind corn and people would come to them. Now you still had to cross those rivers, so they put logs across that people would walk across on a log bridge until they come to a river, you know, that would be too wide for that. So using the uh, knowledge that they had brought with them, say from, New from old England, uh, they began to put timber bridges across. And they used what they might call the royalty lot of, of trusses called the King Post and the Queen Post. Now the King Post Bridge, then, you would send uh, cords, logs across. You would board those logs so that you could, say, run a cart on them. And then they would sag in the middle. What you would do would be put up a pair of braces. And from the center of those braces, you would hang a post to support the middle of that bridge. That's a King Post Bridge. Mm -hmm. And it worked from there. It was the local folks only that built their own bridges because they had some knowledge. They're using the same methods that they were using to build their barns and their homes. If you wanted a longer, if you wanted a longer bridge because the river is that much wider, what you would do would be you extend your king post truss and call it a queen post, where you would put up a pair of braces separated by a horizontal beam. Okay, and at each junction, there would be a post to support the bridge, the queen post. Things got a little bit uh, more developed in the area. They needed longer and longer bridges, and some of the local talent then, not being engineers and so on, would invent a new truss. Then they come up with the multiple king post truss, and then later on, of course, we had uh, a... Uh, a, a noted architect in uh, Connecticut, Ithiel Town, however you pronounce Ithiel, I've never been able to discover, okay, which came up with <clears throat> the lattice truss. And today, most of the covered bridges in Vermont are lattice. And they're called covered bridges because they discovered in the old days that with rain, Mm -hmm. and snow and all of that would begin to rot those bridges so that you had to replace them maybe every few years. When someone who built what they called the permanent bridge in Philadelphia, okay, came up with the idea of covering his bridge, he said that, well, that would make that bridge last maybe even up to 50 years. We have bridges in the state of Vermont now that are much older than 50 years because of those covers. That's great. That's, that's, it, it seems so obvious, but the, <laughs> so simple. But some guy had to think that up and then do it. Yeah. And it's created something which is a practical transportation item, but also an art form in a way. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And why don't you tell us, like, just give us an idea. Uh, there, you say, there, how many bridges are there now uh, uh, still standing in Vermont? Well, there's about 102. Mm -hmm. Okay, but not all of them are terribly original because we've lost some. And... Uh, there's enough interest in the, in the state government and the people of this uh, state uh, to maintain those bridges. So if a bridge is burnt or a bridge is destroyed by a storm, uh, they're replaced in their replicas. What's the newest one? The newest one mm -hmm. would be the, there, head's gone. <laughs> uh, well, I think um, <clears throat> Langley in. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, my brain is right here. That's, that's right. your book, by the way. Tell us about yeah. that book. Uh, oh, okay, surely. Why don't you hold it up so the, the people can see it. Uh, that's a, a book all about covered bridges. And uh, when did you write that? I wrote that. This was first published in 1997. Wow. And it's, it's still going strong. It's fairly popular. Uh, like, there's 15 tours. If someone would take up one of these books, there's tours laid out, 15 of them, where there are maps available in the book then to take people from bridge to bridge without any trouble. That covers the whole state. 
covers the whole state. Now there was a bridge uh, that was, uh, you're going to remember when I tell you about this. We had Storm Irene, the Irene to Tropical Storms. Oh, yes. yeah. Just talking about that to somebody about an hour ago. About really? Irene, yeah. Tell yeah. us about this. Okay, that storm took out uh, the bridge where my mind seems to be blank yeah. for a moment. Bartonsville, thank you. <laughs> well, you got to be quicker. <laughs> okay, the Bartonsville bridge then was carried away. The reason why it was carried away wasn't a problem with the bridge itself, but the river got behind the abutments mm -hmm. and washed it away. And uh, the, the, there was a lady there that, that had a uh, video that, that was broadcast worldwide yeah. on the demise of that poor old bridge. Yeah. And people got behind it. Uh, they got grants. They held uh, sales. They did everything they could to gather enough money and uh, the state, the federal government then stepped in and helped. Uh, they decided then that they needed the bridge, but they needed to carry more weight. One of the problems with our covered bridges today, of course, is that they're not built for 18 wheelers mm -hmm. or a modern traffic for that matter, or even somebody's uh, tour vehicle, you know, with the uh, air conditioning on top. Okay, so they made the bridge taller and they made it longer so that they could keep the abutments out of the river flow and they've got one terrific bridge. You can't tell that it's not an original bridge unless you look underneath where they have something called Gulam Timbers, which gives the bridge its carrying capacity. So you've got a brand new bridge, yep. the whatchamacallit bridge. <laughs> the whatchamacallit. I seem to remember Longley was built in 2018 or something that completely oh. replaced out in Montgomery. The Longley? Oh, um, yeah. Well, okay. That that also is I think a, that uh, might be one of yeah. the more. Yeah. Well, well, you know that that is that is uh, one of the things that huh? yeah, 2018. Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, mm -hmm. the Covered Bridge Society tries to do. All right. Um, the Longley Bridge was carrying milk tank trucks. And it was built back in the 1860s, 18, okay? And they needed to replace that bridge. It had been worked on several times. And the town, you see, V-Trans Construction Division then is responsible for maintaining these bridges. And they work with the uh, Department of the Interior uh, rules on maintaining historic structures. And uh, a bridge that has been on the historic site list, okay, is, has special privileges in its existence. But overriding all of that is the town itself. The town decided that they didn't want that bridge bypassed with another bridge. They didn't want that old bridge replaced and repaired so that it could carry new traffic. They wanted a new bridge, and they got it. Now, uh, the Vermont Covered Bridge Society sets up uh, districts where, they, uh, where we ask local talent, you know, to form a little group, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, wherever there's a covered bridge in the village, you know, they're responsible for that bridge. They're taxpayers. They have a say on whether or not, you know, they want to spend the money on a new bridge. Somebody from outside, our nibbers, you know, that, that uh, they're, they're not going to be punished, you know, with the tax that they're accruing. So they had their way. They replaced a historic bridge. And part of the uh, agreement was that the construction materials for that old bridge would be saved to be put up someplace else. Okay? That's really interesting. Yes. So it's, it's not yeah. just the idea <clears throat> of historic preservation for the, for the sake of, of history and, and architecture, uh, but it's also a cooperative effort to try to preserve, protect, and defend these oh, things. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's really interesting. I was thinking mm -hmm. about that in the way, and it sounds like the Constitution, preserve, protect, and defend. Mm -hmm. And that's what you, you do. 
Uh, yeah. it, it's it's an interesting historical uh, artifice, uh, but uh, you work to make sure that it functions, mm -hmm. and government gets involved, and then people get involved. Right. And yeah. uh, that's an, I, I've been looking over your program as an organization, and there's a, a number of things that you do. Uh, so why don't we go into some of them right now? Uh, what's this project you have called Bridge Watch? What is that about? Mm -hmm. Okay, Bridge Watch. Yeah. We have uh, uh, John Weaver, is a retired engineer from VTrans, mm -hmm. is a member of the society. And while he was working with VTrans, he still is, as a matter of fact, it's a, uh, they still use him. Uh, that Scott Bridge thing that, you might, that has been in the papers lately, he was the designer for the reconstruction of that. Uh, John is our Bridge Watch coordinator and he keeps track of what is going on with the V-Trans and what their plans are in the, uh, in the future for these various bridges. Keeps us apprised of that. Meanwhile, each of us then are responsible when we revisit a bridge and we see that there's a problem with the bridge, we have a form we fill out to send to John. And John can notify the town and he can notify V-Trans. Beyond that, we have Halloween, okay? And we ask the membership then, wherever they live near a covered bridge, to keep an eye on it. Mm -hmm. So that's bridge watching. Yeah, and it's a lot of, just a lot of local people just happen yeah. to be in the area. They just keep an eye on it. That's amazing. That's, it's really, it really show, shows involvement. Uh, Mm -hmm. Almost like a, a, a local ownership of the, of the bridge, taking ownership of yeah. it. Well, there are, there are other things, too, that we'd like to do. Uh, we started out this way, is that uh, you come to a bridge and it's full of wet gravel. So a group of people will come there and they'll sweep it. Uh, weeds are growing up around. There's reeds and, and, and trash growing up around the bridge. Someone will come along and they'll cut it. That's our susk. We do that. We did that until we were confronted with the problem of policing. If we're in that bridge sweeping, we have to be looked out for, so we have to hire a policeman, okay? And the other thing is insurance. We had to be insured to do that sort of thing. Uh, we don't really have the income to be able to do that, so we can look wistfully on and maybe pick up a, an empty paper cup or something. <laughs> Let me ask you this. We've just gone through a terrible winter, and we're almost not over it. Uh, yep. Are there any particular problems that, that happened this winter, the last couple of months? The normal problem, then, is that when a car comes through all that slush, they're dragging it into the bridge. Mm -hmm. Now, we talk about uh, historic bridges. The historic parts of a bridge is the truss itself. That truss is heavy timber, it needs to be preserved, that's why it's covered. Okay, but the floors, the floors have evolved over the years. The floors we have today aren't like the floors our grandfathers had, our great-grandfathers had. The floors are replaced regularly when they need replacing. The siding, one of the problems with the siding is kids that like to swim kick the siding out, expose the, uh, the trusses. Uh, the roofs deteriorate. Uh, V-Trans then took on a great job of replacing every roof in the covered bridge, uh, of the covered bridges in the state with a new uh, standing seam enameled steel roof. Mm. Okay, before then we would have things like uh, uh, cedar, shingle roofs, which retain snow, which brings us into that story. In the old days during town meeting, there were two projects let out, and they were bid for. One was the man who snows the bridge, brings snow into the bridge so that the sleds can go through. You can tell the season when these wagons then lose their sled skids and go back to wheels so you know spring is here. Mm -hmm. All right. There's another gentleman who bids on the job of clearing the roofs of the covered bridges. That's gone by the bar. Uh, now these new uh, steel roofs, these standing seam roofs, shed snow. So you don't have to send somebody up there, you know, at, at, at risk of his life and limb, 
to clear those leaves of leaves anymore. But Johnson wasn't up on that. They weren't snowing the bridges anymore because they didn't need to, but they weren't uh, digging, uh, clearing the roofs either. They had a, a, cedar, a cedar shingle roof on that bridge, and we took a heavy, wet snow. And unfortunately, when that bridge was built, there were no collar ties and no, no ties inside of the bridge other than uh, the, uh, the connections in the wood itself, okay? And what happened is that the snow pressed that roof down and the rafters acted like levers, kicked the, the, uh, the trusses out, the trusses dropped into the river, the rest dropped down onto the floor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, I believe, 2,000. So that's why we have steel roofs, standing seam roofs. Wow. Well, um, what we'd like to do, because we're, we're uh, getting near the end, is, is uh, give you the opportunity to tell what you need from people and how people can get involved with mm -hmm. this organization. It is a membership group. Uh, uh, yeah. How do they get involved? Uh, what, in, what projects are you currently working on? And what do you need from the public? So sure. give you that opportunity sure. now. Well, volunteers are always, always needed. Um, there's a number of different committees um, to get involved with. Um, membership is, is very easy. Uh, we have... Um, just paper applications that people can fill out for membership. There's different levels of membership, individuals, families, life members, and the cost is not that much. But with, with that, you know, they also get uh, a quarterly newsletter mm -hmm. that goes with that. But yeah, like we were talking about with the Bridge Watch, volunteers are needed wherever there's a bridge. Um, and like Joe said, they, they have the biggest voice because they live in the town and they pay the taxes. So, you know, those kind of representatives, um, people that uh, uh, could plan events, um, different things. There's, there's a number of things that could be done, but because of lack of volunteers, it's, mm -hmm. they're not active at the moment. So... Um, Publicity is always a good one, uh, the legislative, um, like we said. So, Let me ask you about this. I understand you, one of your projects is Legislative Watch. What is that about? Mm -hmm. Well, the Legislative Watch is, uh, well, a, 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 a group of us then approached the uh, Montpelier. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the matter of fact, it was the House of Representatives, okay, and where we were working with the... Uh, the uh, chairman of the transportation uh, department where, I don't think department's a word, where uh, we were trying to get more signage before bridges to keep the bridges from being damaged by oversized vehicles, overweight vehicles going through them. And uh, we didn't have a whole lot of luck because of Vermont's laws on signage where uh, we would have been obliged to buy the signs and then pay a fee to maintain them, which was beyond our budgets. Mm -hmm. So we kind of failed in that direction, but there have been uh, members in, uh, who belong to towns that have the covered bridge that took an initiative like Phil Jordan. Do we have that picture? Uh, Phil oh, Jordan. Oh, ad. Huh? Oh, his ad, you mean? Or, oh. Yeah. Uh, You're talking about this picture. Yeah, that one. This one. Okay, do we have that? No, we'll okay. have to send that. Well, anyway, Phil Jordan then uh, lives on the road where the Chiselville Bridge is. And he had noted that uh, 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 many times, like an 18-wheeler would come up that road because he's been told by GPS that he could go through there. Mm -hmm. Okay? So they get to that bridge, and the driver stops. And then at risk of life and limb and people, uh, uh, other traffic, backs that 18-wheeler out of that road and finds another way to go. So what Phil did is uh, he got the town then to invest, and in, I have the text there, on uh, a forewarning sign that's placed out where the, uh, where the truck driver perhaps then can find himself another route before he commits 
to this this trap. Yeah, I can see that eight point two feet. Yeah, yeah, it's not much. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, this is really it, it, it. As we said before, it's a lot more than just looking at paintings and pictures on postcards. It's a very active thing, and and you could use all the help you can get. Uh, yeah both from town officials, legislators, and anybody who watches uh, this program. We're going to publish uh, the website where you have uh, a list of all the covered bridges. Right. And we also have your own website. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from uh, your projects in the future. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, you for appearing on Positively Vermont. Uh, this has been Joe Nelson, a founding member of the Vermont Covered Bridge Society, and Steve Miyamoto, uh, a uh, publicity uh, coordinator and uh, an officer of the group. And thank you both for appearing on Positively Vermont. Thank you. This is Dennis McMahon. Thank you for watching.